was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried for my burden, the nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me, what love divine he gave his life for mine. Suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy untold. His life for mine, his life for mine. Son would die to save a wretch like me. What love divine he gave his life for mine. He was despised and rejected, ribbons of our men and oppressed. I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. His life for mine. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to Luke 19, the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. <coughs> Excuse me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book of the New Testament, Luke 19. We are going to read verses 1 through 10, and we read the verses responsibly. I'll begin, we'll begin together on verse 1, then, to get, then I'll read verse 2, and we alternate like that. We'll end on verse number 10 of Luke 19. And as our custom is, let's stand together. To read the scripture, all of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of Luke 19. Ready? And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little stature. <clears throat> And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Let's read 10 together also. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful singing today from the people of God. Thank you for the 
wonderful truths that have been found in these songs this morning. It's been a blessing to sing praises to you and uh, just to sing about all that you've done for us and what a great and mighty God you are. And Lord, we love you this morning and we're asking you to continue to uh, use the music, the special now, to prepare our hearts that, Lord, we'll all be ready to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this morning. Bless the music to that end, please. In Jesus' name, amen. In the harvest field now ripe and there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place your call to labor seem so small? and little worth. It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Are you laid aside from service, body worn and toil and care? You can still be in the battle, in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it, Live and not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and a race on earth is run, he will say if we are faithful, well, Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, our little is much when God is in it. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful songs this morning. It's ministered to our hearts. It's helped us. It's encouraged us. It's turned our hearts towards you. And Lord, we ask you now that you'll use your word to speak to our hearts this morning. That, Lord, you'll help each of us to focus and to give you our undivided attention, that you'll help us to not allow our mind to wander to other things and allow the devil to snatch the word as it's sown right out of our heart. But Lord, I pray that our hearts would be good soil, that the word of God would fall into and bring forth fruit this morning. So Father, help me as I bring the message and please help every individual as they listen and may each of us be filled with the Spirit of God today. And Lord, may you minister to us as only you can. And Lord, I'll thank you in advance for what I believe you'll do this morning. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first person to reach the status of billionaire was a man who knew how to set goals and follow through on them. At the age of 23... He became a millionaire. By age 50, a billionaire. Every decision, every attitude, every relationship was tailored to create personal power and wealth. But three years later, at age 53, he became very, very ill. His entire body was racked with pain. He lost all the hair on his head. 
in complete agony, and though he was the only billionaire in the world and he could buy anything he wanted, he could only eat milk and crackers. An associate wrote, he could not sleep, he would not smile, and nothing in life meant anything to him. His personal and highly skilled physicians all gave him the prognosis that he would die within a year. The year passed agonizingly slow. As he approached death, he awoke one morning with a vague remembrance of a dream. He could barely recall the dream, but he knew that it had something to do with not being able to take any of his successes with him into the next world. The man who could control the business world suddenly realized he was not in control of his own life. But he was left with a choice. He called his attorneys, his accountants, and his managers and announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals, research, and mission work. On that day, he established a foundation. And that new direction eventually led to the discovery of penicillin, which was cured, a, a cure for the current strains of malaria, tuberculosis, and diphtheria. The list of discoveries resulting from his choice that day is enormous. But perhaps the most amazing part of this man's story is that the moment he began to give back a portion of all that he had earned, his body's chemistry was so altered and so significant that he began to improve in his health. It looked as if he would die at 53, but he lived to be 98. The amazing story of John D. Rockefeller. You know, Nothing changes people like money. Ask anybody about money, and their normal response is they'd like to have a little bit more. But money doesn't make you happy. Howard Hughes had all the money that you or I would ever want, but he wasn't happy. Elvis had all the money he'd ever wanted, but he wasn't happy. There's many in the pro football world and pro basketball, pro athletes that have millions upon millions of dollars and they're not happy. See, money can buy things, but it can't buy happiness. Money can buy things, but it cannot buy satisfaction. Money may be able to buy you a new home, but it can't buy you contentment inside the home. Money can take you places, but it cannot take you to heaven. We've all heard that saying, money talks. And I'm going to talk to you about that this morning. That's a true statement. Money does talk, I know. You say, yeah, mine says goodbye. I know. <laughs> I know, I understand. But, but money does talk, that's a true statement. The money, your money speaks a great deal about you. Okay? Now, don't get uptight, I know. Keep your hands in your lap. Right away, when the pastor mentions money, everybody's hand goes to their wallet. Just not getting mine. Just relax, okay? Everything will be okay. Money talks a great deal about you. Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus. Your money says something about your salvation. Here, Zacchaeus seeks to see Jesus, who he was, and and. Jesus, of course, surprised him by knowing his name and by calling him down out of the tree uh, to say, I'm coming to your house today. And there, the Bible says that he received him joyfully. And, and Zacchaeus stood in verse 8, and here's what he said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I've, I give to the poor. And, if I've, and by the way, that was incredible enough. Tax collectors were not known for giving anybody any money. They were known for taking everybody's money. Okay? It's uh, worse, worse, we liken them to our IRS, but they're far worse than the IRS. 
uh, they, they, would, they would cheat and they would take from people and much more than what was required by the government. Uh, they were known to be dishonest. That's why no one liked tax collectors. So we know that something's happened to this guy because now he wants to give half. Did you notice? I'll give half of my goods to the poor. 50% of what he has is going to be given away. Something's happened to this guy. But he doesn't stop there. What else did he say? If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Four times that amount. He says, I'm, uh, and that's, that's an amazing, you know, what, what brought about from a tax collector who wants to get everything he can, in fact, get more than what he's supposed to have, doesn't, I don't care how dishonest I got to be, I don't care who I take it from, I don't care how I get it, I'm just going to get it. How does that guy now say, half of what I have I'm giving away? And anybody I'm, that I've wronged, I'm going to give him fourfold back. What in the world has happened to Zacchaeus? I'll tell you what happened. He received Jesus joyfully. That's what happened. Jesus changed his, his, changed, he changed his whole idea about money. He changed his whole thought about what money was really all about and what possessions were all about. Look just in the chapter before Luke 19, <clears throat> chapter 18. This is where <clears throat> a certain ruler came to Jesus. In verse number 18 of chapter 18, a certain ruler asked him, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Verse 20, Thou knowest the commandments, Do not commit adultery, Do not kill, Do not steal, Do not bear false witness, Honor thy father and mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, He said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. And Jesus says, Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very, what church? Sorrowful, for he was very rich. And Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful. He said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom, enter into the kingdom of that God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? He said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Here's what, a, what a contrast. Here's a fella who doesn't receive Jesus, who doesn't have salvation, and he's very sorrowful at the prospect of parting with any of his money, any of his possessions. Contrast that to Zacchaeus who said, Hey, half of what I have I'm going to give to the poor. Hey, uh, well, if I've taken anything wrong, I'm going to restore it, and I'm going to restore it fourfold. Four times as much. What changed? What changed is Jesus passed by when they met Jesus Christ. When you're, when you're saved, you want to give. When you're saved, you want to help. When you know Jesus and you have salvation, see, how many of you be honest enough to say before you got saved, you thought, well, all they want down at church is they just after your money. Anybody think that way before you were saved? Look at this. Yeah, come on, don't be bashful. It's all right. Huh? Now, your attitude's totally different, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, it's not about that. And by the way, it's, it's all God's anyway. We'll come to that in a little bit. But you understand, what, what changed the way you think about money is salvation. Your money talks about your salvation. And let me say, going along with that, number two, your money talks about your heart. Your money talks about your heart. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Would you turn over there? First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Notice verse 19 with me, will you? Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves, Jesus speaking, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your, what church? There will your heart be also. So I'd find out that my money talks about my heart. 
Billy Graham said that your checkbook is a theological document. It tells you who and what you worship. Now, I know that's outdated. Uh, how many of you in here don't even have a checkbook? Huh? Okay, most of you still do. How many of you never use it? <laughs> most of everybody just use a card and use the card all the time. You know what? Your card, your bank account, it shows who and what you worship. It shows where your heart is. Your, your mouth may say, I love God. Does your banking account say the same thing? Well, that's quiet. Your mouth says, I love missions, but does your bank account say the same thing? Your mouth says that souls are important to me, but does my banking account say the same thing? My mouth says I love church and I love the church of God, but does my bank account say the same thing? You're not truly consecrated to God unless your bank account's consecrated too. You're not really consecrated to God unless your checkbook's consecrated too. Oh, preacher, if I win that, that millions of dollars in the lottery, I'll give half to the church. Well, let me ask you this. Are you giving half of the 40000 a year you earn now? If you, won't give, if you won't give 10% of what you make now, what makes you think you give 50% if you want a million? Money shows where our heart is. We're not far from the shoe. And if you want to go to an Ohio State football game, I... Depending on what game it is, I suppose if you went to one of the uh, early games when they, you know, they're playing, you know, St. Mary's School of the Blind or something, you know what I mean? You'll, you'll, you'll maybe pay 50 bucks for a ticket or something. They can get them fairly cheap. That's cheap, 50 bucks. Probably 100 bucks. I think, <clears throat> I think if you go to a, a, a Michigan State or a Michigan or Wisconsin, somebody like that, you're going to pay what, Brother Jason? What do you think? 500 bucks a ticket? 400 bucks a ticket, easily. Sometimes Michigan game goes for th over $1,000 a ticket. Hey, hey, how many times you turned the TV on and you looked over at Ohio Stadium at the horseshoe and thought, wow, look at all the empty seats. No, it's always packed, isn't it? Always packed. Always filled up. Somebody will put out 100 bucks or 200 bucks on the ticket. You'll spend, if you're going to eat anything there, you're going to plop down 20 bucks real easy just to get a drink and a hot dog probably. And uh, then, then if you want to get a jersey, you'll spend anywhere from thirty, forty, fifty to a hundred dollars on a jersey. You'll pay to park, and and before that day's over, you, you'll easily drop two hundred to three hundred dollars on one football game. And that doesn't count the people who get there at eight o'clock in the morning and tailgate and bring food and cook it and 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 do all that before the game, and then stay after the game and eat some more and cook out and all that. All that expense that doesn't even count that. And then go to church the next day on Sunday and put $5 in the offering and complain about how the church always wants your money. Think about that. <clears throat> it just shows where your heart is. People do that. I, I'm amazed that the, the, guy, the guy who has those Buckeye necklace around his neck and he wears all white and a cape and all that stuff, and he's at every game. Not home game, away games. It doesn't matter where they play. Anybody ever wonder, what's that guy do for a living? You ever wonder, how, how can he afford to go to all that? Go get, fly out there and go to every, every game he's there? Uh, that's just amazing to me. But it shows you where his heart is. <clears throat> Money talks about our heart. I read this. I think it's good. There's a disease which is particularly rampant in this part of the 20th century, 21st century. It's called cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> it was actually discovered about 34 A.D. and it ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. It's an acute condition which renders the patient's hand immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. The remedy is to remove the afflicted from the house of God. Since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in alternate environments such as restaurants, golf courses, 
etc. True. You know what money talks? Money talks about your heart. It talks about where your heart is. Money talks about your salvation. Money talks about your love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved that He gave. <clears throat> Loving, giving talks about your love. The greatest of all gifts that was ever given was the gift of Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. God the Father gave that gift to you and me. Why? Because He loves us. Because He loves us. Why does He love us? I have no idea. But I'm glad He does. I don't know why He'd love us. Because He didn't love, there's nothing lovely in us. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He sent His Son to die for us. Giving doesn't get any better than that. God so loved that He gave. And if I so love, I will I would not, I, I, I thought I would not rob somebody I love. I don't want to rob somebody I don't love, but I, 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 certainly, I certainly wouldn't rob somebody I love either. I don't want to do that. Go to the last book of the Old Testament, would you please? Malachi chapter 3. God puts a, a serious charge to His people Israel here. He asks them a question. Verse 8 of Malachi 3. Do you notice the question God asks? He says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Israel had robbed God in tithes and offerings. They had held back on God. The tithe is a word that means a tenth. So a, a God, God in His economy, and, and by the way, you say, well that's Old Testament. It is absolutely Old Testament. So is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You like that, don't you? Huh? That's Old Testament too. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's Old Testament. Hmm? Uh, uh, Isaiah 53, about all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned ever his own way, but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's Old Testament. But we like that. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he'll give thee the desires of your heart. That's Old Testament too, but we like that. What you have to admit is, I like the old parts of the Old Testament I agree with, and I don't like the ones I don't. Okay? And the Lord Jesus, when He was rebuking the Pharisees in the New Testament, and He told them about their, their tithing the men and the coming and all that, He said, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. He didn't condemn them for their tithe. And the tenth belongs to the Lord. He's never rescinded that. Anybody I've ever met, and I hope you don't get mad at me, but if you do, deal with it. The, the, only, the only ones I've ever had in 35 years, and September will be 36 years of being in the ministry, the only ones I've ever had disagree with me and say, I don't think we have to tithe, are ones who don't want to give 10%. The ones who give beyond that and have gone to 15 and 20% of their income, they don't have any problem saying about tithing. Because they've passed that mark long ago. And you can certainly give uh, abundantly. Hey, you can get to where you get into 2 Corinthians giving where he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. You sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. 
God says, I'll, I'll measure it back to you with the same measure you give it to me in. But here, he's talking to Israel, of course, his people, and saying, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And basically, he's saying, listen, if tithe is 10%, and, and that belongs to God, the tithe is the Lord's, Leviticus 27.30, and, and that belongs to him, that means if I got a $400 paycheck and I don't give God $40, I'm robbing God. My check was $500 and I don't give God $50. I'm robbing God. And I'm not just robbing God. He says, just like He did to Israel, I'm cursed with a curse. I'm under a curse from robbing God. And, and I'm wondering, the reason that maybe there's not a great deal of blessing on our churches in this day and age, I just read the statistics. Of 2016, the average church member gave 2.3% of their income to God. Pastor W. A. Criswell was a pastor in Dallas, Texas for years at the First Baptist Church, and he told of an ambitious young man who told his pastor he'd promised God a tithe of his income, and they prayed for God to bless his career. At the time, uh, he was making $40 a week and tithing $4, but in a few years, his income increased and to the point where he was tithing $500 per week. He called on the pastor to see if he could be released from his tithing promise as it was getting pretty costly. And the pastor said, I don't see how you can be released from your promise. But we can ask God to reduce your income back to $40 a week since you had no problem tithing on $4 a week. Now it doesn't really figure, doesn't you think, man, if God blesses me like that, and God prospers me like that, I should have no problem giving more to Him. I should just be natural and show out, out of gratefulness and a love for God. But it shows us just how self-centered we can be. I read this story this week about a pastor who was invited to be a keynote speaker at a stewardship banquet in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And the pastor had asked him at the banquet, he said, would you please bring a strong message on tithing? And this wasn't a liberal church. It's a Bible-believing church, a, a Christ-centered church, one who, who, who said they, they believed the book and lived by the book and the Bible is their final authority and so he, the, the pastor said, I, when I got up to speak, I made this statement. The purpose of my message tonight is to convince you that if you're not currently tithing, you're living in unrepentant sin. Well, I got everybody's attention. Most of the people enjoyed the message, but a few didn't. He said before the message, we had a catered meal. And he said it included some very overdone and dry chicken. The pastor told him after the banquet that one of the disgruntled members who refused to tithe came up to him and said, well, pastor, the best thing about this night was the chicken. Some people don't tithe because they just refuse to do so, no matter what God says. I hope you're not in that category. You know, what God says here is, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what God is saying? I dare you to try this. Prove me. Put me to the test and see if there won't be blessing upon your life. If I, I, Are you cursed with a curse? Or could you have the windows of heaven open to you and a blessing poured out upon you that there would not be room enough to receive it? I hope you, if you're not giving, don't rob God. Don't, don't get the curse. Get the blessing. Get the blessing of verse 10. Get the rebuking of the devourer for your sake. I mean, it just means that, listen, things you have, God will, God will keep the, as He did Job, he'll, he'll put that hedge around there. He'll keep Satan away. He'll keep him. He'll, hey, your stuff will last longer. Okay? Things will go a lot farther than what they ever, anybody ever thought they'd go if you'll faithfully give to God and give the Lord what's rightfully His. Now, you understand, God, God created us, and He made us, and we're made in His image, and, and, and we're built to be giving and loving people. It's, it's in every man, I believe it's in every man whether they're saved or they're lost. 
There are lost people that give to charitable things and charitable causes. The United States leads the world always whenever there's disasters or things that happen, when, when there's hurricanes or earthquakes, anywhere, man, we give. Lost people even give. That's in us. God made us that way. Because God is giving. And He made us to be giving. And desires that... that and, and listen, God doesn't have us give because He needs it. He's got everything. He owns everything. He, he, he doesn't need that from us. He loved us so much that He gave to us. But we give to show our love for Him. Giving shows your love. Do you love God? Does your checkbook show it? Does your bank account show it? Money speaks of your heart. Money speaks of your salvation. Money speaks of your love. Number four, money speaks of your future. If you turn back again to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount, money speaks of your future. In fact, get Matthew 6 and then put a finger over in Luke chapter 12, would you please? We'll go there right after we read Matthew 6. We'll go Matthew 6 and we'll turn over to Luke chapter 12. In Matthew 6, notice with me again verse 19. You notice what Jesus said? Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You know, you, what Jesus is saying is you can't lay it up. You, you can't take it with you. But you can send it on ahead. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. There's really only two choices. You e truth is, you either send it ahead or you leave it all behind. That's the only choices you got. Notice, Howard Hughes left it all behind. Elvis left it all behind. Marilyn Monroe left it all behind. Bill Gates will leave it all behind. But the money you give to God, the money you give to God's work, you'll see it again. Why? That's laid up in heaven. Well, where are we going to go when we take our last breath here? We're going to heaven. What's up there? My treasure. That's where I've laid it up. And that's going to meet me again. That's where I'll see it. Laying up treasure in heaven. Church gives you that opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven. You express your love for God and for others. One pastor of a large church in Kentucky said that Americans, and I'm not sure the year he said this, but he said that Americans in that particular year gave $14 billion to their churches. Now that sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? And it is. Until you stop and think, those same people spent, same Christian people said they spent $60 billion a year on diet and exercise products. $14 billion to church and $60 billion on diet and exercise products. There was a wealthy but very selfish lady who dreamt she died and went to heaven. She was told that she'd be taken to the house which had been prepared for her. And as they drove down the street, they, she noticed many beautiful mansions and saw in them people whom in this, this life to her were very poor and somewhat rejected by others. Finally, on what seemed to her as kind of the outskirts of heaven, she was shown a very small run-down house and said, this is where you live. She complained and protested. But here's what they told her. We're extremely sorry, ma'am, but this was all we could do with the materials you sent up. This was all we could do. Money talks about your future. What will you see when you get to heaven? What treasures have been laid up there? 
you either send it ahead or you leave it all behind. He was born in about 1874 on a farm near Ontario. He was the second of 11 children brought up by Mennonite parents. At the age of 18, he took a job at Ferguson's grocery store in Fort Erie, later invested in a cheese company in Buffalo. He went to Chicago, Illinois to look after the company branch in that city, and while there, his partners eased him out of business. So he stranded in Chicago in 1903 with $65 in his pocket. But he put his knowledge of merchandising to good use. He obtained a horse and a wagon. And every day he bought cheeses in the wholesale warehouse district of the city and resold them to the small stores, saving the merchants the cost of making the trip to go buy the cheese themselves. The business began to prosper, and by 1909, several of his brothers had joined the company as permanent employees, Charles, John, Fred, and Norman. In that year, the business was also incorporated under the name of J.L. Kraft and Brothers Company, with James Kraft as the president. He was head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation, and James L. Kraft would give approximately 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes for many years. And he said this, The only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. Money talks. I know Wall Street's gone crazy in the year that President Trump has taken office. 25,000 looking at 26,000 places that nobody ever thought they'd see the market go. And, and I'm just reminded, and I would remind you, and, I'm, and, I, and if your money's in there, praise the Lord, I hope you get a lot of it and give to God. But you understand, what goes up will come down. And, and 2008 wasn't that long ago. And, and folks lost a lot of money when the stock market came down. I tell you, a place you can invest, and it never comes down. It always goes up. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Money talks. It talks about your salvation. Money talks. It talks about your heart. It talks about your love. And it talks about your future. Now ask yourself this morning, what does my money say about me? What does my money say about me? No man can serve two masters. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say, if you have... No, He says, you're going to serve one of these two. You just can't serve them both. And so serve God. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And, and the way God looks at where our heart is, is He looks to see where our treasure is. Money talks. What does your money say about you? Let's pray. Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for the attention of folks today. Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of the Bible when it comes to talk about this issue of money. And Lord, it, it ought not to make us uncomfortable. It, it's, it's just amazing how we don't get uncomfortable if we talk about going on vacation and what the resort wants or what the motel wants or for, for money or deposits or we don't get upset about the ball game and the money we put out for that or the, the, the Christmas gifts we buy for people. But Lord, I, I think we're shamed when the preacher shows from the Bible when you talk about money and people begin to get upset. Lord, forgive us for that. And I pray that this morning that each of us would search our heart. We'd look at our bank account. We say, what does my bank account say about my love for God? What does my bank account say about my heart? 
What does it say about my salvation? What does it say about my future? Am I sending it on ahead? Or am I going to leave it all behind? Am I robbing God? Does He get the tenth of all my increase? I pray, Lord, You'd speak to hearts this morning. And that certainly no one here would be guilty of robbing You. And if so, they would bow the knee today and ask Your forgiveness and make it right before You. Lord, we want to we want the money you can trust to us to speak of our salvation and to speak of our heart and to speak of our love and to speak of our future. Help it to be so in each one of our lives.